So let's start with the rapid fire round. Uh, the first question is, at what age do you want to retire? 65. How long does it take you to get ready in the morning? Uh, depends on the definition of ready, one hour. Most embarrassing moment of your life? Uh, pass. Favorite color? Light blue. What time of day are you most inspired? Early mornings or late evenings. How many hours of sleep can you survive on? Long term, uh, six. Fill in the blank. An upcoming technology trend is blank. Pass. The city in which the best kiss of your life happened. Uh, Helsinki. Pick one, Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. Top one, uh, Zuckerberg. The biggest mistake of your career? Um, pass. How do you relax? Uh, reading. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? One. A habit of yours that you hate? Pass. The most valuable skill you've learned in life? Uh, push for new things. Your favorite Netflix show? Um, Witcher. One word description of your leadership style? Uh -huh. Empowering. Top priority in your daily schedule. Get stuff done. Ideal vacation spot. Uh, tropical sea with excellent diving. Uh, key factor for maintaining work-life balance. Uh, dividing the time slots. Memorable career milestone. Uh, product launches. The last song you've been listening to. Uh, pass. The last movie that you saw that had a good impression on you. Not a good impression, but it was uh, Notre Dame something. By this now. All right. All right. So we're very glad uh, today to welcome uh, Yuka Pekka Sarmankaita, Vice President of AI and Special Projects at Elisa International Digital Services, a uh, company with, which may not be familiar to many observers, although presumably definitely familiar in Finland and Estonia. Let me start with that. Well, people might remember about a month ago the submarine cable in the Gulf of Finland encountered problems. People thought it might have been cut by some uh, interfering power there. It turned out to be okay. Uh, I understand that submarine cable was, in fact, the Elisa cable. Is that right? Yeah, it was. And and things were okay? There was there was minimum or to no damage? Uh, well, there was damage, but like uh, for the network operations, there was no, no problems. Ah, there was damage, sort of like an amateurish attempt to try to do something. Uh, yeah. But it, it is true, is it not? You know, you, your operations are mainly centered in, in Finland and Estonia, but with uh, other locations around the world. What are your activities outside that main core? Yeah, so this uh, international and digital services, we are building up, um, let's say, software solutions for different kind of operational purposes. And our target segments are with ELISA industry, manufacturing industries. We are, for example, doing quality control systems for semiconductor manufacturing. Then we have ELISA Polysta, that is perhaps a bit uh, easier to guess from the telecom background. So in that area, we are doing service assurance and network optimization solutions for other operators. And then we have uh, energy initiative where we are doing distributed energy storage solutions for helping the zero carbon energy transition happen more smoothly. No, that's right. I, I noted that uh, I noticed 
you're, you're divided, uh, as I can see, into the, the two main sections that, that uh, you mentioned there. Uh, Polystar, mostly telecom products, and so-called in, interest, interest IQ or industry, which is, uh, I understand, industrial software. Those are your two main divisions, correctly? Or you, was there a third one, an energy one, that you just uh, mentioned? Yeah, the energy is, let's say, uh, less established, smaller than these two, but it is in the same portfolio. Oh, okay, so again, uh, telecom software, uh, industry software, and then an energy company uh, grouped together under one uh, label, uh, Elisa. It would seem very different sorts of uh, enterprises. What sort of synergy is there between the three? Uh, so if we, uh, I fully agree that, let's say, the customers, like what kind of systems they are operating and for what purposes, like the, totally different. But if we look at the, from the, let's say, software and how the data is flowing, these are actually surprisingly similar. So all are handling very large scale time series, event series data that is coming from tens or hundreds or thousands or large amount of data points. They need to like figure out based on that very large volume of data, how the operational system could be further optimized, how to sort out different kind of problems, be it like deviation in the manufacturing quality or deviation in the network service quality or deviation in the energy market balancing service control system quality and so on. So like uh, from that perspective, like data handling and taking like the good handle of the data, making sense of that and then uh, doing the solutions that help the operators of those systems do better decisions, faster, more automated, like that is uh, more or less like the concept is same across these very, very different customer industries. Okay, so th there's those uh, similarities, but one, one could speculate that uh, uh, theoretically, at least, uh, one of these divisions could be sort of spun off as its own company on stock exchange or something. Wouldn't that still be possible? I mean, it's probably not what you're thinking about right now, but the structure seems set up for that sort of thing? Well, we are more on the acquiring side, but yeah. in, in principle, structure is such. Yeah, understand, right? Well, um, zooming in in particular to Polystar, your telecom uh, products, there is a, a so-called uh, telco data platform which uh, is among your leading products. Could you describe uh, what that's all about, the telco data platform? Yeah, so like uh, traditionally telecom operators have like more or less like taken from certain windows or set of windows the technologies and as the operators like uh, want to fine tune their operations and make them like more and more smarter and towards the goal of having like self-driving networks, it, it's like from our perspective really imperative that you take the data away from the source system so that you can build build up the intelligence operations around that system and the telco data platform is in a way is the first step for that that you are able to pull in the data across the different uh, uh, windows and across the different elements of the source and then you have like the baseline for which you can start to build up the automation and more intelligent operations. Okay, because our research indicated that uh, this, this is supposed to be uh, particularly strong when it comes to expanding or, or scalability as firms grow. How, how does that work? How does, how does scalability particularly addressed by the features of this platform? Well, telcos tend to be in pretty large scale already, but of course, like with those that are operating in uh, many and in some cases great many national companies, then there's more like this, like how uniform they make the initiatives between the different national operations. So it's uh, like always in large or very large scale, but uh, sometimes there is more attention of making it more uniform across different regions. Okay. What sort of data analytics are provided to the customer as part of this uh, platform? Well, we have uh, both, uh, let's say, baseline capabilities like portals, ready-made applications for things like performance management, uh, network operating center operations like handling and so on. So there are those kind of things. And then uh, in addition, it's possible to build new views and build new capabilities. So it's like both, both pre-packaged and then more like a customized alternatives as well. And this customization might be happening with us or it might be happening with a customer's own, 
own people or some third parties uh, as well. What I hear then is it mostly prepackaged maybe tools or pieces that the customer can configure the way that, that uh, he likes and pre presumably with some good information and training initially from the Elisa side. Yeah, in a way like uh, some prepackaged capabilities to start easily with. Okay, and then uh, they, they take it from there according to their imagination, how they want to put together and build those tools. Correct. Okay. Uh, well, uh, going to your own background, a very interesting background before you, you ever uh, showed up at Elisa, I understand uh, founded uh, two startups on your own. What were those uh, all about? Uh, we were doing uh, recommendation systems for the media industry and well for tele telecom operations as well. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, recommendation systems? Yeah. Oh, interesting. For for the telecom industry? Uh, well, for the media industry, but like it was related for the telecoms as well. Well, telecoms and media are every now and then interlinked. So collaborative filtering and those kind of. Oh, collaborative so filtering rec recommendation on a on a business to business level. So helping business leaders make better decisions. That was more on the business to consumer side. Oh, okay. So we were building up the recommendation right. engines for the consumer services as well. Okay. And uh, also, we saw on your CV, uh, head of, of the Connected Home. Uh, was that uh, a project within Lisa? Well, you, you were there by then, for, when you were no, here? No, that wasn't the Nokia years. So that was the time of the, let's say, early rise of the smartphones and building up the ecosystem for the smartphones to be interacting with the TVs and stereo systems and so on. So like, but that was ages ago at that point of time it was new. Nowadays it's taken uh, for granted since it is like widely deployed pretty much with each and every high-end music system and each and, each and every TV system. Okay, but that was a title of yours within the Elisa corporate structure or was, or was this another one of your, your startup uh, efforts? No, that was on uh, Nokia. That was Nokia. Okay, so you were, uh, for, for a while there, before Elisa, you were working with Nokia. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing I also saw was that uh, Elisa has, uh, has won a Finnish award for uh, the Sustainable uh, Brand Index uh, winner. In fact, for the, the third, or at least the third, or maybe fourth year in a, in a row, reflecting your efforts in sustainability. And could you go into that, uh, what, what you do with sustainability that, uh, that makes you such an outstanding company to, to pick up these awards? Well, I think there are like many, many different angles here, but like I focus on the energy side because that is a, a very, energy, uh -huh. very, very big part of like where the carbon dioxide side is coming. Yeah. So like fundamentally, like what telecom operators are doing, they are spending energy to transfer information. That's like the pretty boring, like physical explanation about what operate, operators are doing. Yeah. But then like what needs to be done like in that area, like the things that we did already several years ago is to like upgrade the energy purchasing policy so that you are having the renewable sources in the purchasing and you can have like the guarantees of origin and so on for that. But then you should like also minimize the consumption of the energy, so doing the all the capabilities of the hardware, especially on the radio network side and further optimizing that so that we have been like doing for quite many years, both like together with the vendors and then some extra optimization on top so of that on our own. Cutting down energy consumed. Yeah, like making sure that it is used. And it's also important to upgrade to the new technology generation, both on the fixed side and then on the mobile side, since the energy efficiency with optical is significantly better than with copper and with the 5G it is significantly better than 4G, let alone 3G. So like important to like keep the pace and like uh, shut, uh, shut down the old technologies as early as possible to like have the consumption. And then we have like, uh, those are all things that we have been doing for quite some time already. And then on the energy side, we are now going like even further. We have upgraded our base station infrastructure. So that's the part that is consuming the largest part of uh, operator energy consumption. So we have upgraded that so that we have extra batteries in and we have our own control system that second by second for each and every base station, we are able to select whether they are consuming the energy from the electricity grid 
or from the batteries or whether they are taking in extra energy in from the grid for not only for the run equipment but for the batteries as well. And this flexibility capacity we are using for two different economic purposes. First is that we are able to adjust the timing of the incoming energy. So typically taking more in during night hours, less in on uh -huh. the energy grid peak hours. Yeah. And this is excellent thing for the environment as well, because it's the peak hours when more fossil generation is required. And there's a risk of, uh, let's say, especially with wind production, that you might have like peak wind production at times when the energy system is not really requiring it. So from that perspective, this flexibility to actually like from the consumption side, follow when the production is plentiful or let's say that zero carbon production is plentiful this is a system level important thing and now we are able to do that for our own own consumption or the largest part of the consumption that is coming from the mobile network side and then the second part of the economic thing is that we are also bundling this flexibility capacity as service for the for energy grid stabilization. So with FinGrid in Finland, we are providing the services from telecom infrastructure, how we are balancing the national elect electricity grid. And that in Nordic model is very like market market operated and we were the first first one uh, in so-called automatic frequency restoration reserve market with the distribution solution already last year. So it, it even sounds like uh, saving energy as a service type uh, offering. In a way. And it's not only the saving energy, but it's also the timing of the consumption like it's good that the society is like consuming energy if it means that we are consuming less fossil fuels of different kinds. Mm -hmm. But the timing of that consumption needs to be like matching for the wind and solar production. And for that, like new intelligence needs to be done. And we have been like piloting that in our own infrastructure in rather large scale. Mm -hmm. So again, you mentioned how timing is so important that, that might complicate things a bit. Could you venture? Any sort of percentage figure in terms of what percentage of your energy use is renewable? Is that even possible? From purchasing perspective, it's 100 percent and has been for quite some time, but that is with the guarantee of origins. And now with this system, we are able to also add just so that the like real hour by hour consumption is like matching the inexpensive times when the variable production so wind in Finland is high. Right, no, I wanted to ask, so, so Finland is, is advanced enough in terms of having the renewable energy available for you to plug into uh, both solar and wind? Uh, wind is, well, solar is increasing as well, but we are pretty far north, and especially during the yeah. winter time, like um, solar has its limitations when the sun yeah. is not, not shining, but wind production has been uh, picking up like uh, really, really nicely. We have several thousands of megawatt hours of new wind production peak capacity in the country from the last two years. So like that is really positive development. And I haven't heard really of wind farms out in the in the Baltic Sea there. These these are mostly on land uh, wind, wind farms. Then. Yeah, uh, the great majority right now are like uh, in the land areas and uh, mm -hmm. uh, like offshore wind production that's like uh, in pilot states is it it will be coming but it will like the onshore is still like where the great majority of the new new wind farms are coming online okay well uh, shifting to another important subject uh, with your, your digital services again uh, along the polystar line or maybe also industry uh, the question of course of cyber security of uh, ensuring your customers are not hacked what are your measures uh, to assure them on that score to maintain the security on the uh, on the networks that you uh, control? That's an excellent topic. We don't have that as a, let's say, separate product line or anything like that. It is more like in all the service areas and all the solutions areas where we are working. It tends to be like critical infrastructure at the national level and from that perspective like uh, giving our heritage that like we are coming from operating the critical infrastructure because we want to bring that same same best practices and even improve those than when we are working with the customers but it's not like a separate business it's more so that it's super important aspect uh, of pretty much all all three 
on, on, on the manufacturing industry, like they have very high security concerns, the operators is like well known that it is nationally critical infrastructure, and then on the energy, we are in a way at the intersection of the nationally critical energy infrastructure and nationally critical telecom infrastructure, so security is um, well key. Right, right. And uh, you know, related to that, although different, I think, is the question of stability, making sure that your network just simply you know, doesn't go down at all. Uh, and uh, you know, how do you build that in? It must be a similar approach that what you just described in terms of not, not a special thing, but built into every aspect of your operations. Uh, yeah, of course, it's also related on the physical, physical items. So for example, if we discuss this uh, radio network, Elisa's radio network is also used for government services like border guard, police, fire brigades, those kind of things. And in that area, like if for example, there's a big winter storm that is like breaking out the electricity grid distribution in potentially large parts of the country. Well, the mobile connectivity is essential to coordinate the corrective actions. So in a way, like if the mobile part is shut down, it will make the correction of the electricity grid so much harder to coordinate and probably quite a lot slower as well. And from that perspective, uh, we do pay a lot of attention both like on the control capabilities and also on the physical hardware that we have for the backup purposes. But of course, this is only one example, but that is like a key, key for the uh, mobile infrastructure. There are like other parts of the resilience that, that need to be like tackled in different other areas. No, precisely, especially for, for public uh, customers, security, that sort of thing, you, you have an especially uh, uh, important uh, role for stability. You know, what did, what is the extent of your of your public sector contracts in uh, in Finland and Estonia or even beyond? Uh, what what part does that make? What what fraction of, of your business uh, is is for public uh, instances like that? Uh, let's skip this because this is like more for the telecom operations on that side. It is like very big and so on. But for the ideas part, not so. This is kind of from ideas perspective a bit like okay. sidetrack. Sure. Or let's say they are like uh, on the Elisa Polista side, they are like aspects, but let's skip this is a bit like. Okay. Well, again, you're, you're uh, vice president of AI and special projects, and, and you're, you would be especially the person to ask to look into the future about the new technologies coming down online uh, from, of course, uh, 5.5G or advanced 5G or to the, the telco take up of, of new innovation and, and artificial intelligence itself. What, how does the future look to you? Uh, as uh, as the special projects uh, VP within the company? Well, from the AI perspective, I think we have even more opportunities around now than we ever had earlier, and it was not like boring times even earlier, and now it's getting even more exciting. But uh, I think it's like a slight difference that from the communication perspective, that is in a way a bit like saturating. Like the what 5G is able to deliver starts to be like sufficient or what like optical fiber is able to deliver that starts to be sufficient for a great majority of things. But then like when you can take excellent connectivity as granted, then you can start to build up more value like on top of that. And I think this is like a big shift that it is important to not only delve deep into connectivity items and how that can be further in in enhanced from the fifth generation to the sixth generation, but also to like look the right way, what are like the total like solution possibilities. And then in, in those areas, AI is typically a key enabler. Okay. So it sounds like that uh, you're getting enough, even with 5G, you're, you're not so much in a hurry then to introduce the so-called advanced 5G or 5.5G coming down the line? Well, we are pushing for the envelope in that area, but I don't think that that's the bottleneck for most things, like the bottlenecks are elsewhere. And from that perspective, it's really important to like look at the whole technology stack, what is required for the solutions, not over-focus on the connectivity layer only. Okay, and and uh, broadening out to uh, to Finnish and Estonian telecoms in general, because of course you have uh, competitors there. Uh, 
Um, there is the sector in general very receptive towards uh, uh, towards taking advantage of new uh, technological uh, possibilities. Um. I I would say well there's also evidence like in these markets that like uh, all three have been very active in many fronts of the digitalization. Um, all three you, are you talking about the three components of uh, of the company? Well, uh, all 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 three like uh, if you're speaking about the operators. In, oh, there, there are three uh, separate yeah. operators in Finland, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so like all operators are heavily engaged with the customers on different parts of like how to make di digitalization mm -hmm. smoother. Of course, like different emphasis with the different operations. This is good for the competition, but all in all, I think like the operators are well received to be more broader digitalization partners than the connectivity layer only. Oh, okay. And you know, government gets a say in this. Uh, what's your attitude towards the support offered by the the two national governments, or maybe even the EU, in encouraging and supporting, maybe even financially, this this uh, technology take up? Well, I think there are like few few items, and if I a bit like overemphasize the energy side, since there is like so urgent need for the energy items. First is like the government may, needs to make sure that like the field is open for competition. And this is like a legislation and it's like regulation is to really make sure that like and especially in the energy side there are still like possible monopoly structures and not all like parts of the energy market are really open for competition and so on and really making sure that like the competition friendly legislation is actually in place and it is also like enforced that is like definitely something that the government and no one else can do and then like when that competition friendly regulatory framework is, is in place then i believe the second important role with the government is to like uh, have some level of funding for really like spearheading new Basically items research. Well, basic research tends to be like easily interpreted that it's like delivering results, but I'm, I'm more like funding for a new innovative pioneering solutions at the early stages, it's not like long term subsidies, but for the first part, and then if they take off, they should be like commercial viable by themselves, and if they don't take up then they should deserve to die and i think like in this way like accelerating the market experiments and doing the market experiments in a bit more like serial scale and so on this is an area where both national and eu level funding can play a significant role as well so those two things i believe are like the key items for the government well this these past these, these things you're just mentioning uh, are you saying they exist or are these are your recommendations for how it should be uh, from the Nordic perspective, uh, for this like competition friendly regulation, I would say that this is like in excellent shape. Many other areas uh, in Europe, like uh, hopefully, develop towards that direction in the in the years to come. And then for this like uh, channeling the funding for the pioneering efforts at the early stages of the take-up, I, I believe like there's lots of like goodwill towards that direction, but still like the volume and let's say the decision making speed for these kind of initiatives can be still still improved. I think the intention is that it's more like just like getting the execution in place as well. Okay, so again, it, uh, you, for your first point, you, you do like the, the state of competition uh, regulation in, in these countries. This goes so far as to even allowing competition from outside the country or even, of course, public procurement by the Finnish government, shall we say, of telecom services if, it, if they're better from some other country rather than uh, some internal in, um, national company. Well, competition is competition. It should be like open for all. Uh -huh, sure. Sure. Although, yeah, many, many want to keep their jobs, but yes, the, the best should win for sure. You know. Good right. So the last question for you is of a personal kind. What would you be doing in your life if not this? Uh, okay, so like I have been always working with some angle of uh, better data utilization, some angle of analytics, AI, ML kind of items. So I think like 
I would have that still, but which is the application area and what kind of methodological angles and what kind of business angles like, that could be something totally different as well. So I think this like being at the intersection of new technology development and new business development, that is like definitely something that I would like to keep, but like which is the domain way it is like applied and which are like then the hands on like issues to be tackled, that could be many other things as well, and has been historically many other things as well. I have been like changing industries every five, ten years. 